This episode of The Lutheran Cartographer is brought to you by Audible. Get a free trial offer along with a free audiobook at lutherancartographer.com slash audible. The Lutheran Cartographer, episode 28. Welcome to The Lutheran Cartographer, the podcast where we explore what it's like to be Lutheran in different areas. Today we are joined by Pastor Magnus Sorensen. He is the pastor of Augustana Lutheran Church in Denmark. Pastor Sorensen, welcome to the show. Thank you. So help uh, orient us geographically. Where exactly are we in Europe? Uh, at the top of Germany, there is a, a large peninsula, uh, which is Jutland, and there is the mainland of Denmark. Then besides Jutland, we have two big islands and a lot of small islands, uh, and together that's, that's Denmark. Uh, I'm in Jutland, in, uh, which is in the, the, the western part of Denmark, the, the big peninsula, but it's the eastern part of it, in the middle, uh, but, but at the coast uh, in the east uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of Jutland, uh, near, the, near the big city Aarhus, which is the second largest city in, in uh, Denmark. It's just north of that in a small village that I live. I see. So we usually talk about what it's like to be Lutheran later, and we'll talk about what it's like to be Lutheran um, currently in a bit, but I want to take us on a little historical tour. Uh, the Reformation came to Denmark pretty early, didn't it? How long has it been Lutheran? Uh, since 1536, uh, Denmark was made uh, Lutheran by law in, in 1536 by the king. Okay, so could you te tell us a little bit more about that, how that happened, and uh, how it's carried forward? Oh, uh, well, it, uh, the, it, there has been a Lutheran movement in Denmark for some time, uh, and, uh, and well, at, the, at that time, the, the king decided that now it, uh, now Denmark became Lutheran, and then uh, he uh, fired all the bishops, and uh, he employed some new superintendents uh, to, to watch over the church, and uh, he introduced at, f at first the, uh, the, the Augsburg Confession and small catechism, but also other works, the Apology, which was part of the church ordinance of 1539 that was made by uh, Bugenhagen and uh, recognized by or accepted by Luther too. Uh, so originally uh, we, had, we had, I think the, the loci of, uh, of uh, Melanchthon was also part of the the Corpus Doctrina to begin with, but eventually, uh, I think by the Danish law of 16, uh, I think it's 80, is it 86 or something, or 87, uh, it, uh, they, I, it, they had boiled it down to only the, the small catechism and the Augsburg Confession, which was, which is today seen as the confession of the, of the, the Danish state church. Uh, so they didn't get the Book of Concord, uh, the whole Book of Concord, because they had already made the the, the law when when the formula of Concord was was made, and uh, there's a story that the king burned the Concord. He didn't want to uh, to introduce the conflicts of uh, from Germany to Denmark. Um, we did have some Philippistic tendencies in the beginning in Denmark. Uh, there was a, 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 a theologian, Nils Hemmingsen, who was. He was eventually fired because of his uh, his crypto Calvinism in 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 the in the view of, of the Lord's Supper. So there has been some Philippistic tendencies and uh, also uh, Pietism uh, had a big influence on Denmark eventually, and uh, rationalism too. Uh, um, and it was there was a bit, and and Pietism kind of was became conservative and uh, at some point. Uh, to begin with, they were really kind of the progressive movement, but they became more conservative when the rationalists came. Mm. Uh, and so they, they kind of uh, worked together with more reactionary Lutherans. But, uh, yeah, but, but, but a lot of the conservative movement in, in, in the Danish state church became pietistic. Uh, and we really never had a big confessional movement later on. There, was, there were some individuals uh, in, in Denmark in the 19th century when, when the big confessional movement was in, in, uh, in Germany. 
uh, there was A.T. Rudelbach, who was uh, he was in he was for some time actually he was in Saxony with with Stefan and uh, and Walter uh, and those who who left for for America there he was a super attendant there, and there were a few others, uh, and there was in in 1855 uh, uh, there was a young man who started the first. That was right after we got religious freedom. There was a young man who started a, a, a Lutheran free church in Denmark, which exists today too. And that's where I was coming from originally, but we left it years ago, 13 years ago, when we started our congregation because of some doctrinal uh, disagreements. And that church, the Evangelical Lutheran Free Church, is a, is a sister church of the Missouri Synod and was very from very early uh, on. Um, so there, is, there was a small confessional, more or less confessional. It was still influenced by pietism in some ways, uh, which is also one of the reasons we left. Um, but but uh, but there, is, there, is, there are some small confessional Lutheran uh, individuals or small small groups. But but uh, but much of, of of the church landscape in Denmark is is either liberal or conservative Lutheran, but kind of pietistic. I see. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, let's come back to that in a while. I want to bring it up to the present day as you started to and ask you a little, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you ended up where you are in Denmark. Okay. Well, I'm not, well, I'm only around, what's that, 20 kilometers from where I'm born. So, so, <laughs> uh, so, so ge geographically, I, I, <laughs> I haven't moved a lot. Um, I live between. Uh, it is actually an, an old village that was uh, halfway between the, the city where I'm born and raised and the city where I studied theology and uh, and law later on. Uh, that's where we we ended up in, in this small small village. Uh, this was where they they changed the horses when they moved from those two cities, bigger cities. So I see. Uh, that's where I ended up. Uh, now I I was born in Ranas, uh, which is uh, I think it's the sixth. Sixth largest city in Denmark now. It used to be the fifth, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, I was born and raised there. Uh, my my mother went to church. My father is not. He's not a Christian. Uh, it was and and a lot of my upbringing was in a socialist uh, kind of commune where people lived together. Uh, we, they had their own apartments, but but they kind of ate together and and so on. Uh, so I was, I was not baptized as a child either, but uh, at the time of confirmation, my parents made the deal that I had to go to confirmation class in the state church, and then I should decide whether to be confirmed or not. Um, and for some reason, I decided that I wanted to be baptized and confirmed. And I also, I remember I made the decision that I wanted to uh, to be a Christian then. Uh, but man's will is not able to to make him a Christian I found out so yeah I uh, I don't think I became a Christian there uh, but then uh, I think was it I think it was in in ninth grade or something like that my 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 class was going to uh, on a trip to Malta and I hadn't been in a plane before and I was about, I was afraid of flying so uh, I I like Luther when he was in the thunderstorm I said that I uh, I didn't say I would go to, to a monastery, but that I would uh, start going to church because that's kind of what I had promised if I survived flying with a plane to to Malta and back again. <laughs> so, this is Malta, Italy? So, yeah, yeah, Malta, yeah, yeah, south of Italy, yeah. Um, and uh, I survived, so uh, I, I started going to church in the state church. There was a, a liberal church, uh, kind of liberal church, um, and... I started reading more and more about Christianity. I came in contact with some charismatics, and uh, at some point, I uh, I was I was just about to get rebaptized. I mean, I was baptized as a as a as an almost adult, but I don't think I had I was converted then. So I was thinking about getting rebaptized, and for some reason, I read something about uh, Bo Yats, uh, who wrote The Hammer of God, and uh, I read the book, and it convinced me. Uh, about uh, baptism, that, that, that baptism is not my work, but it's uh, God's work. Uh, and then I started reading the small catechism, too, 
when I was in church and listened to the liberal liberal pastor, I was, I, was, I was going to church with my mother, and she always knew when I was not too impressed with the sermon, I took the, the hymn book out and started reading in Luther's small catechism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I became more and more Lutheran, and eventually I went to uh, the university to study theology. Uh, and that was in uh, 1999. And I think it was in 2001, the Danish State Church subscribed to the Leuenberg Concord with the Reformed, uh, where they they declared church fellowship with the Reformed churches. And uh, a half year after that, I I uh, left the State Church and became a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Free Church. Uh, I was studying theology by then, and I went to one year to Fort Wayne in uh, Indiana to study theology there too. Uh, eventually, we had to leave the Evangelical Lutheran Free Church for some doctrinal reasons. Uh, and we formed the Evangelical Lutheran Augustana Church in Aarhus, just like, uh, what I think we were nine people there, and we are maybe 15, 16 people now, I think, um, in this small congregation. We are meeting in our upper room. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I have, I'm, it's it's a part-time job. I get a little salary for that, and and most of my work is. Uh, I took a law degree afterwards after studying theology, and uh, I work with with law in my in most of my time now uh, with the uh, compensation and tort law. Uh, so. I see. And then in in the weekends I'm a pastor. So. All right. Good deal. So you told us that you're 20, about 20 kilometers away from where you were born. But, of course, you didn't just move 20 kilometers and just stay there. As you've talked about, you've been to university. You came over to America to study at Fort Wayne for a while. Tell us a little bit about how you'd compare and contrast the different places you've been with where you are now in terms of the good and the bad or anything else you'd like to say about mm. the contrast yeah, yeah. you've seen, the differences. Well, I've uh, I grew up in uh, in a in a city, and I studied in cities, bigger cities, and now I live in a small village, which is is uh, is very different, uh, and I like it. I like being in a small village, even though though it's close to some bigger cities, it's uh, it's another world than than being in a in a big city. Uh, you, I mean, we don't know. Uh, the neighbors too well, but we, I mean, you, you say hi to the neighbors and you know some of the neighbors and uh, it's it's very different from, from a city where you usually don't know many, many neighbors, uh, uh, depending on where you live in, in, in a big city. Uh, it's it's quiet here and uh, we, we are very close to, to nature, which is nice. I mean, I can walk out to uh, with my dog and and be in uh, in the field and, and and look at fields and uh, uh, so so um, so I, I like being closer to to nature uh, and the other places I've lived well I haven't this is the first place where where we uh, I have a big garden I like vegetable gardening so so uh, so so this is nice with having a a little piece of of of, uh, of garden that I can and I can do some gardening in. Yeah, we don't have the, the bad things are that we don't we don't have a school nearby. We have to drive to to get our kids to school and uh, also uh, groceries. We have to drive for that. But uh, I mean, if if we're in a big city, you can usually walk to to uh, to all of that uh, in Denmark. Or take take yeah, yeah take a bus. So help us understand a little bit of when we're talking small town and large city. What what scale are we talking about in uh, in terms of number of people in your town in your village? Are there do you think about two thousand people? Uh, how large or small are we talking? Yeah, I think I, I remember shortly after we moved here, it was around thousand people. I think I think maybe we are between two and three thousand now. It's it's growing this small town. Uh, so, so it, it is getting bigger. I think between two and three thousand. I'm not sure, but I think that's. I remember that when it, when they said that now we are more than thousand members uh, uh, who live here. I see. And then the the large cities that you're nearby, how how large are they? Uh, the the large city that we're just north of is uh, three hundred and fifty thousand uh, uh, living there. 
So quite, uh, quite large. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, so we started to, to talk about this, but I want to delve into it a little more where you're talking about the best place, best things about where you are. The You already talked about the nature. You might say more about that or anything else that you'd like to say about so far as like the good pl- parts of the area. Say that somebody is has a job offer to your village. What, what kind of things would you say, this is the reason you got to move here? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's very close to the highway, but also close to nature and it's not in a big city. So it's, it's, uh, I mean, you can easily get, get uh, everywhere uh, from here, but it's not in a big city. That's, that's, that's the, the main reason. If you like to be in the countryside, but also want to be close to everything, this is, this is the right place to be. Kind uh, of the best of both worlds in that way. Yeah, 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 I think it is, yeah. And and it's uh, it's a place where you can also easily get out to uh, Duos land, which is a, a peninsula on the peninsula, and it even has some small peninsulas there that are very nice that you can uh, go out to. And uh, there's a there's a big there's a big museum with a I think it's the the, the longest uh, uh, wood ship. It was it was an old uh, warship. Uh, Forgotten Uland that you can go out and see there, and there's a big of a, a lot of uh, beautiful nature out there. Uh, so it's close to to a lot of nature and all, but also close to the cities and close to to the to the highway. Uh, I see. Let's take a moment for a word from our sponsor. A lot of us have a lot of downtime right now, and there's been no better time to start a new audiobook with a free trial from Audible. You get a free audiobook of your choice that you get to keep even if you decide not to continue with their service. So far as books you can check out, I'd recommend looking into Luther's Bond to the Will. That's on Audible that you can pick up as your free audiobook. But if you don't like that one, you can always choose a different one from their plethora of options. So go ahead and go to lutherancartographer.com slash audible to get your free audiobook today. Let's get back to our guest. So tell us a little bit about what are some of the challenging or difficult parts of, of where of living where you are. In in Denmark in general or in this this place here? Both. Both, okay, yeah. Yeah, because I think there's not a lot. I mean, the the house prices here are higher than they are in if you go farther west. So if you if you want to 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 just have the nature, uh, you you should go. On, if you want to have more land, you should go farther west uh, in in Jutland. Uh, this is too close to the big cities, so it's it's a big expensive house prices for for being close to nature. But it's uh, because you can usually get that cheaper if you if you go out west. Um, so we have to to earn some money to 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 live here, uh, and we have very high taxes in Denmark. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's hard to uh, to uh, to for families to to have one uh, or going partly home or uh, I mean you you have you almost have to be two two full time uh, working uh, two persons full time working because of the high taxes that you have to pay all the things that that. Uh, I really wanted to to do more of myself, like raising your kids and and stuff like that. Um, so we we have had my wife has is only has a part time job, uh, so so we can manage uh, living here uh, uh, because I have a, I have a, a decent salary. Um, but but uh, but it is a it is hard to to raise a family in a, in a country that that where that wants the state to do everything that the family used to do, mm. uh, taking care of the, the children and the elderly, because they take the, the money uh, in, through the taxes. Uh, so, so, you, so, so it's, they, they take them anyway. So, so it's, <laughs> you have to pay, pay, pay for them doing it, even though, even if you don't want them to do it. So, yeah. so, that's, so, so the high taxes in Denmark may, makes it difficult to have a kind of a traditional lifestyle. Uh, I see. Uh, and that can be harder if, if you're closer to the big cities, you will have, I mean, it's more expensive to, to live there uh, and uh, uh, because the, the house prices are, are higher. Okay. 
So let's talk a little bit more about that. I know in Germany to the south of you, for instance, it's actually illegal to, to school your children at home. What's it like to raise a family in Denmark? Well, it's a constitutional right to homeschool. So, so, so you can do that. Uh, the issue is that you have to, the government has to check it that, mm. that you are doing it right. So you'll get it. It might be harder to to homeschool uh, to homeschool in in and and teach your children what what you want them to learn by homeschooling than teaching them if you send them to a school and and then teach them when they come home what they, you want them to learn. So so what we've been doing we we we're sending our children to a, to a private school. Uh, now and uh, we had them in a government school. Uh, or the, the the eldest one, the oldest one, went to a government school, but but uh, a public school. But but now they are both in a private school. Um, so, but but you can homeschool. But but if if you have to have the government check what you're teaching your children, I would rather send them to a private school or pu public school and then and then tell them what's wrong with what they're learning there. I see. Um, because there's, then there's less scrutiny on you then, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, we've had the government looking over our shoulders for some years because we uh, we, had, we have adopted our children. So, so you have to have the government has to be involved in that. So we we didn't want the the government to to start to check us more than they've already done. So. Yeah. Okay. So say a little bit more about raising uh, raising children in in your atmosphere. I know that. Uh, so Americans stereotypically think of, uh, especially Western and Northern Europe, as very uh, progressive and uh, very anti-family in many ways. Is that kind of how true is that stereotype, and what's it been like for your family? Well, I think to some degree it's right. I think you can find areas in in the United States where it might be worse, but you can definitely also find places where it might be better. I think. So I think Denmark is, is kind of in between. We have, we have, we do have we we do have a welfare state. So 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 when it comes to to the money issues, there's a lot of redistribution of money. Uh, I think it's it's easier in that way that that uh, I mean uh, the mother has has one year where she can go home with the kids that is paid by the government. Uh, so so uh, I don't think I'm not sure if you have something like that in the United States, but but. Uh, so, and but I think Denmark is a bit worse on that than uh, some of the other. I think in Sweden, I think it's three years or something like that. So, 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 uh, but, but I think on 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 the other hand, I think Denmark is more it's a more freedom loving country than uh, than than the other uh, Nordic or Scandinavian countries, and 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 even more freedom loving than I think parts of the progressive. United States are uh, in that. That's. I mean, we we don't like that the government is to tell us what to do. Um, so so uh, so like the freedom of speech. Uh, you probably remember the Muhammad drawings and and the the big crisis years ago, where yes. the Danish government refused to to uh, to do anything about uh, about those drawings uh, I don't think something like that could have happened in in Sweden I think they would have would have apologized you but we're not going to do that in Denmark so so I think there is there is some uh, there's a there's a, there's a freedom loving individualistic spirit in Denmark that is both good and bad but it's it's different than than in some of the other in it's different from Germany and uh, different from Norway and Sweden we 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 don't like like authority as as much as as they do there. Uh, we're not as collectivist in our thinking, so so uh, I think we like our freedom more, uh, uh, and that's both good and bad. I mean, uh, it's, it, it, it has some progressive sides that that people will. I mean, they will do whatever they want, uh, and and they don't want the government to or anyone else to interfere in their in their lives. So it would be hard to get kind of. Uh, abortion prohibited in Denmark because people would, uh, but but on the other hand, uh, it's easier to, it's it's easier to claim your freedom against the government in in in, in other respects. Uh, when when uh, so so it's it, it's harder for the government to to say that you can't do this or that, uh, but if if you're a Christian. I see. Okay. 
So let's now talk about some of the things that you'd recommend seeing and doing if somewhere to, someone were to come visit uh, both Denmark in general, but also your area of Denmark. What are places to eat or things to do, things to see? What would you recommend people check out if they're in the area? Uh, well, if if they're in my area, I would I would I th- I think they should go to Appletoft and see Forget Newland, which is this uh, very long uh, ship, old ship that was part of of uh, it, that's been part of some of the wars that Denmark has been in with with Germany in in the past, uh, and it, I think it's the longest uh, wooden ship uh, still still existing today. Uh, so, I would definitely recommend go and see that. And that's also close to the area where there is this smaller peninsula with a lot of hills and, and small villages uh, that I often like to compare to the, the Shire in the, because it's small hills and it looks a bit like the Shire with, with small, uh, small houses. And, uh, uh, and my, my, part of my, my father's family is from, from that area. So I, I like going there a lot. Um, I think you should go, go and look there. Um, now, if you want to, to and Denmark is a small country, so so it doesn't feel that way for a Dane. Because if we are going to Copenhagen, we have to plan that for a long time. But for an American, that would be something you could do in the afternoon. It's only a three-hour drive to Copenhagen. So, uh, but that that that's that's a long way for a Dane because we're such a small country. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you could you could uh, you could drive to Copenhagen and. Uh, and, and see uh, Copenhagen. There's a lot of beautiful churches and buildings and castles there, and the Little Mermaid that everyone wants to see. Uh, so you can just follow the, the Japanese tourists, and uh, they'll take you to the to the Little Mermaid uh, that you can uh, <laughs> watch and take a picture of. Uh, I, the, the last American I I told to to go there, he wasn't particularly impressed by the Little Mermaid, but I think you should see it if you are in in the country. So. Certainly, because everybody will ask you if you've seen it, and then you can. Yeah, yeah. Then you'll have to yeah. justify not seeing it if you haven't. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah and, then, and then there's of course the the, the real Legoland. I remember I, I talked talked to someone who had been in America once and had been in Legoland there, but the real Legoland is is in Denmark. So so you should go there, the original Legoland. Is that in Copenhagen? No, it's in Bilon, which is in the southern part of Jutland. Uh, the big peninsula where I live. So it's uh, uh, not that far from Germany. Okay. All right. So check out the real Lego land. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. So now I want to, most of our listeners are probably are familiar with the terms uh, pietism and rationalism, but I want to come back to that since that did seem to be kind of a key part of kind of what the confessional Lutheran Church is dealing with in that area. Could you give our listeners just a very brief sketch of what Pietism is and why it's why it's a a problem? Yeah, Pietism was a movement that was it started in Germany. Uh, it was inspired by uh, by the Puritans in in, uh, in in England when they started translating books into German. Uh, and they this they had this inward focus where you are not focused on the means of grace, but you kind of you doubt your own faith. You, they lost the ability to to just recognize that faith is there. And they started they had to analyze themselves and their inner self to to find out whether they had faith. Uh, and um, so so uh, so they had to to look at the fruits of faith and a lot of other things to to make sure that they had faith. So they kind of they introduced the reformed uh, or the Puritan self-analytical spirit into the Lutheran Church. Uh, they started to, um, and they had a, they had different, they would had this in different degrees. But some of them started to to uh, to uh, despise the ministry, the office of the ministry, and uh, and they have their own. They had their own uh, meetings apart from the um, from the official meetings of the church, uh, with with lay preachers and uh, some enthusiasm uh, already from the beginning. Actually, in Germany, they had uh, they had uh, prophets. Uh, later on, not so much, but then came the charismatic movement that got into the Pietist movement uh, later on. Um, but how we see it today in Denmark is that we have these movements that are 
doctrinally open, more doctrinal open than the old Orthodox Lutheranism is. Uh, but then they um, focused a lot of 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 the the inner uh, the inner life of the believer uh, instead of on the on the means of grace uh, as that which makes uh, God's grace to me certain. And they also have they meet they have separate meetings from the church. They also go to church, but then they have separate meetings where they have lay lay preachers coming and and uh, preaching uh, to them, uh, usually on a on a night during the week. And uh, the con- conservative Lutheranism in the state church is uh, is is very much bound up on these on these pietist movements. Uh, there's not much uh, confessional Lutheranism or conservative Lutheranism in the state church left that is not part of these pietist movements. Uh, originally, there was a there was a, a bit of a conservative development in the in the in the state church in I think in the 60s that was not uh, part of the pietist movements, but but eventually they they mixed. Uh, so. Uh, so, so when you say when when you talk about these movements in Denmark, a lot of people will see them as conservative Lutheranism, but it is conservative Lutheranism mixed with with a with another spirit where where you uh, you uh, look at a lot of of what what's happening inside of you instead of what's happening to you in the means of grace. That makes sense, uh, and I I think one of the things that observers should from the outside should maybe take away if i'm i'm hearing you correctly and correct me if this isn't kind of the way you would put it is that just because uh a certain church or certain movement in the church is opposing the bad progressivism that we should oppose doesn't necessarily mean that they are theologically sound is that maybe a Hmm. way of thinking about it yeah 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 it is yeah okay yeah yeah. Yeah. Um, when we had uh, Pastor uh, Brun from from Norway on a couple episodes ago, he would he talked a lot about kind of the the struggles with Pietism. So I was interested in getting your perspective as well. Yeah. 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 Of course, he's he's in a in a different position in the state church. I, I'm a pastor of an independent church. That is, I mean, we are Orthodox Lutherans, so we are very much in opposition to the state church and and also the movements there. Um, so could you tell us just a, a, a little bit about that? Um, Americans are very unfamiliar with the idea of a state church. Uh, as you know, we have a very different approach mm. to, to the way things work that way. Tell us a little bit about that and how, how you deal with being independent from the state church. Well... Uh... I mean, the, the state church, I mean, I think I'm not sure if the numbers are correct anymore, but I, I remember at one time it was around 80 percent of the population are members of the state church. Wow. Many of them don't go to church uh, mm-hmm. at all, but but uh, but but a lot of them are members of the state church. So it might be lower today, it might be around 70 percent, maybe. I'm, I, I know it's it's dropping the, the membership. Uh, it's. We call they call it a, a, a people's church, and they say that it's different from a state church uh, because when the constitution was made, it was made a law that that it, they had to to later on make a constitution. They never did that, so it's it's it re, it's really not different from a from a from from a state church. Um, so, but it's uh, the 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 parliament they they do very little in terms of of. Uh, Interfering with the with the church, and that's they are saying that that's because it's it's not a state church, it's a people's church, but but they have to anyway. I mean, when they got same-sex marriage, uh, the bishops asked them to make a law that applied to the state church, so and they did that. So so they are, but they are listening to to what the bishops are saying, and uh, and the bishops are, are elected by by the state church. But but if if the parliament they want to change something in the state church, they can legally do it. Uh, um, so, and they did that a few years ago when they introduced same-sex marriage in the state church. Now they are still permitted to not the pastors. They are still permitted to refuse to uh, to uh, to do that. But but uh, I think that's a matter of time mm. only. I see. Okay, so as we start uh, 
uh, closing the podcast, I want to make sure that I give you the opportunity to send our listeners to uh, where we where would you like to to send them, whether that's to your church website, uh, places to follow you online. Where would you like to send our listeners? Uh, well, I, since most of them don't know Danish, I would send them to. Uh, there's a bit. Of, there's a little introduction. If you go to our church fellowship. Uh, we have only two congregations in, in, in the fellowship. I mean, it's called the Confessional Orthodox Evangelical Lutheran Communion. The website is coelk.org, C-O-E-L-C.org. And they can, they can see a, a small in, introduction to, to me there uh, and, and, and our church, if they want. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, Pastor Sorensen. What parting thoughts do you have for our listeners? Well, uh, come and visit me. Uh, if if <laughs> if there are conversion Lutherans nearby, I would uh, love to say hi to to, to people who, who want to come to Denmark and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, show them some things. So uh, you, everyone is, is is can contact me if they want to to see some, to see this part of Denmark. Wonderful. What's the best way to get in touch? Uh, I think it would be Facebook. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Sounds good. Thank you again for your time today. God's peace. Yeah. Okay. You too. Thanks for listening to The Lutheran Cartographer. For more about the things that we talked about today, check out the show notes page at lutherancartographer.com slash 28. I encourage you to check out that Audible offer to get that free audiobook that you get to keep. That's at lutherancartographer.com slash audible. I encourage you to subscribe to the show on Stitcher or on iTunes so you don't miss an episode. And while you're there, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave a rating and a review so that more people will find and enjoy this podcast. Until next time, I'm Nicholas Weber. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.